Gasul, are you watching this? Survey team leader Gasul grimaced. Just what exactly did Hartier think he was doing, of all the stupid, unnecessary, infuriating? The team leader made himself stop and draw a deep breath. He also made himself admit the truth, which was that as effortlessly irritating as Hartier could be any time he tried, there was no excuse for allowing his own temper to flare this way. And it wouldn't have been happening if he hadn't been watching, and if both his stomachs hadn't been hovering on the edge of acute nausea. Then there were his elevated strokane levels, not to mention the instinctual fight-or-flight reflexes, mostly flight in his species case in point of fact, quivering down his synapses. Yes, Hartier, I'm watching, he heard his own voice say over the link. He knew it was his voice, even though it seemed preposterously calm given what was going on inside him at the moment. But his next words betrayed the fact that his calm was only voice deep. And did you have something in mind for us to do about it? he asked pointedly. No, but surely... Hartier's reply began strongly only to taper off plaintively, and Garcoul felt most of his irritation dissipate into something much more like sympathy. His deputy team leader's natural officiousness and pomposity were an undeniable pain in the excretory orifice, and his fanatical devotion to paperwork was rare even among Barthoni. Hartier was also prone to assume his answer was always the right answer to any problem that came along, and he was a pusher, the sort of fellow who would trample his own dam and herd brothers in pursuit of the tastiest grazing. But at this moment, the sick horror echoing in the depths of his voice was completely understandable. It wasn't going to make him likable. Nothing was ever likely to accomplish that miracle. But Garcoul felt an unusually powerful sense of kinship with Hartier as he heard it. I wish there was something we could do to stop it, too, he said more quietly. Unfortunately, there isn't. Unless we want to break protocol, at least. He heard Hartier inhale at the other end of the link but the deputy team leader didn't respond to that last sentence. It did put their options, or rather their lack of options, into stark relief, Garcoul reflected. The hegemony council had established its survey protocols long ago, and the Barthona had played a prominent part in their creation. There was an excellent reason for each and every aspect of the protocol's restrictions including the need to restrain the enormous temptation for a survey team to intervene at a moment like this. Make sure Kurgar and Jerame are recording this, he said now. He could easily have passed the message himself, but it was kinder to give Hartier something to do. This is going to be an important part of our final report. All right, Hartier acknowledged. The easy-going, centaur-like Barthoni were singularly ill-suited to the sort of spit and polish some of the hegemony's other member species seemed to favour. A few of those other races made bad jokes about it, Garcoul knew, but that was all right with him. He and his team didn't need a lot of sirs or bowing and scraping to get on with their jobs. They knew who was in charge, just as they knew each of them, likeable or not, was a highly trained and invaluable specialist. And every one of them was a volunteer, out here because they were the sort who always wanted to see what was on the other side of the next hill. And perhaps, even more importantly, because of their race's species-wide commitment to what the hegemony survey force stood for. Unlike some other species I could mention, he thought sourly, and returned his attention to the visual display. The planet they were currently surveying, designated KU-19720, was a pleasant enough place. Its hydrosphere was a little more extensive than most Barthoni would really have preferred, and the local vegetation would have been poorly suited to their dietary requirements. But the temperature range was about right, and however unsustaining the planetary plant life might be, parts of it were tasty enough, and it came in shades of green that were undeniably easy on the eye. 
The only real drawbacks, if he was going to be honest, were certain aspects of the planetary fauna, especially the dominant planetary fauna. At the moment, the scene the survey remotes were showing him was less green than it could have been for a lot of reasons. First, because the area he was watching was well into local autumn, splashing the landscape with vivid colour, and showing more than a few bare limbs as well. Secondly, because those remotes were focused on a narrow strip of open ground between two patches of woodland, and that strip had been recently ploughed. The even more recent rain had transformed the turned earth into a mud bath deep enough to satisfy even a liatu, just waiting to happen. Which, he thought, only underscored the insanity of what he was watching. Surely the lunatic local sentience, and he used the term loosely, could have found a better spot for their current madness. Gasul? The new voice on the link belonged to Jorem, the team xenoanthropologist, and Gasul was darkly amused by his tentative tone. Jerem was the team member who'd been most insistent on their remembering that the local sentients, humans, they called themselves, were still mired deep in their planetary childhood. One could scarcely expect them to act like adults, and it would be both unfair and unjust to hold their behavior to the standard of civilized races. The team leader couldn't quibble with Joram's analysis of KU-19720's dominant species, but the xenoanthropologist had been looking down his snout for Bartham-centric prejudice at anyone who criticized the humans ever since they had arrived in system. Gasul suspected it was Joram's way of demonstrating his own enlightened superiority to his teammates. Yes, Joram he said aloud. Can I deploy some audio remotes? the xenoanthropologist requested. Why in Cladru's name do you want to do that? The video is going to be bad enough. Gasul made a harsh sound deep in his throat. I hope the council's going to put this under scholar seal when we get it home. But even some of the scholars I know are going to be losing their lunches if this is half as bad as I think it's going to be. I know, I know, Jorame sounded unhappy, but he also sounded determined. It's not often we get a chance to actually see something like this happen, though, he continued. We don't do it, and neither do most of the other races, but from what we've been able to determine about the local societal units, these people think this is a reasonable way to settle political differences. Hopefully, if I can get the pickups close enough to the leaders on each side... I'll be able to establish that and monitor their reactions and decisions as the effort proceeds. And just why is that so important? Gasul demanded. Because some of my colleagues back home are going to reject my analysis without a hell of a lot of supporting data. It's so alien to the way we think. Excuse me, Jerome, but could that possibly be because they are aliens? Gasul heard the asperity in his own voice, but he didn't really care. Well, of course it is, the xenoanthropologist shot back. But these creatures are more comfortable with this than anyone else I've ever observed. They remind me a lot of the Shangari, actually, and we all know how well that's working out. I'm only saying I'd like to have as much substantiation as possible when our report goes before the Council. Their attitude just isn't natural even for omnivores, and I think we're going to have to keep a very close eye on them for a long time to come. Thank Cladru, they're as primitive as they are. At least they've got time to do some maturing before we have to worry about them getting off planet and infesting the rest of the galaxy. Gasul's nostrils flared at the mention of the Shangari. As far as he could tell, these humans probably weren't any worse than the Shangari had been at the same stage in their racial evolution. On the other hand, they probably weren't a lot better than the Shangari had been either. And as Jorem had just pointed out, unlike the Shangari, they were omnivores, which made their behavior even more bizarre. Which presented Gasul with an unwelcome command decision, 
given that never mentioned, never admitted to codicil to survey's official protocols, the one which had been slipped into place very quietly by executive order and without any debate before the General Assembly of Races, after the Shangari were granted hegemony membership. This was the first time Gasul had actually found himself in the uncomfortable position of applying that codicil, but the classified clause of his mission orders made it clear one of his team's responsibilities was to provide the Council with the means to evaluate any new species threat potential. Exactly what the Council meant to do with such an evaluation had never been explained to him, and he'd been careful not to ask but Jerame's last sentence had brought him squarely face to face with that classified clause. The team leader still didn't care much for the thought of recording everything that was about to happen in full colour, complete with sound effects, but he was forced to admit, grudgingly, that in light of the orders Jerame knew nothing about, his request might not be totally insane after all. What do you think, Cougar? I think Jerame has a point, Garthoul, the team's Zeno historian said. He too knew nothing about Garthoul's classified orders, so far as the team leader was aware, but his tone was firm. Not remotely anything like happy, but firm. Like you, I hope they'll put this under scholar seal when we get it home. But this is pretty close to a unique opportunity to get something like this fully recorded. The data really could be invaluable in the long run. All right, Gasul sighed. I'll ask ship commander Syrak to see it. Far below the orbiting Bathon starship, a young man with a long pointed nose and a savagely scarred face stood looking out through the morning mists. His name was Henry, Duke of Lancaster, Duke of Cornwall, Duke of Chester, Duke of Aquitaine, claimant to the throne of France, and by God's grace, King of England, and he was twenty-nine years old. He was also, although no one could have guessed it from his expression, in trouble, deep trouble. It was obvious to anyone that he had overreached, and the chivalry of France intended to make him pay for it. His siege of Harfleur had succeeded, but it had taken a full month to force the port to surrender, and his own army had been riddled with disease by the time he was finished. Between that, combat casualties, and the need to garrison his new capture, his original field force of over 12,000 men had been whittled down to under 9,000, and only 1,500 of them were armoured knights and men-at-arms. The other 7,000 were longbow-armed archers. Nimble, deadly at long range, under the proper circumstance at least, but hopelessly outclassed against any armoured foe who could get to sword range. And truth to tell, Harfleur wasn't all that impressive a result for an entire campaign. Which was why, two weeks after the port surrender, Henry had put his army into motion towards Calais, the English stronghold in northern France, where his troops could re-equip over the winter. It might perhaps have been wiser to withdraw his army by sea, but Henry had chosen instead to march overland. Some might have called it a young man's hubris, although despite his youth, Henry V was a seasoned warrior who'd seen his first battlefield when he was only sixteen years old. Others might have called it arrogance, although not to his face. Not a man to whom the wise offered insult, Henry of Lancaster. It might even have been a sound, strategic sense of the need to salvage at least something more impressive than our floor from the expedition. Something he could show Parliament that winter when it came time to discuss fresh military subsidies. But whatever his reasoning, he had decided to reach Calais by marching across his enemy's territory as proof the enemy in question couldn't stop him. Unfortunately, the French had other ideas— and they'd raised an army to confront the English invasion. 